My name is Ronnie Green, and I have the pleasure and privilege of serving as the Vice Chancellor of the Institute of Ag and Natural Resources here at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and as Vice President of Agriculture and Natural Resources for the University of Nebraska system. Welcome this afternoon to our final lecture of the 2013-14 academic year here uh, on our campus. Uh, we're very proud of what the Hearman Lectures has allowed us to do over the last three years. Um, due to the generosity of a gift from Keith and Norma Heerman and their family. Uh, Keith is here with his son Scott today. Uh, if Keith, if you'd stand, please, please join me in thanking the Heerman family. Our focus in these lectures deals with food security, natural resource security, energy security, rural community sustainability, and security around the world. And we've had the pleasure of bringing leading authorities across a variety of topics to our campus through the lecture series. This year, Sally McKenzie uh, started our year off with a great lecture on GMOs and, and genetically modified uh, organisms in the crop sector. We were pleasured to have uh, the Honorable Secretary of Agriculture, Tom Vilsack, uh, with us in November. A great panel on the future of agricultural research in January, led by Kathy Wotecki, Under Secretary of Agriculture currently at USDA, and former Secretary of Ag, Dan Glickman. And most recently, Robert Pearlberg from Wellesley and Harvard was with us in February to talk about the culture war uh, that's currently uh, revolving around food and politics. So we've had a great year, and we're capping it off with a wonderful panel dialogue this afternoon on the role of water and food security in early childhood survival and development, a global perspective. I'd like to introduce just quickly a few of our, our special guests that are with us. I see President Milliken is here from the University of Nebraska. Thank you, JB, for being here. Uh, Susan Fritz, our interim provost, also from the University of Nebraska, is here. Welcome, Susan. We're very pleased that Jeff Rakes, the CEO of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, is also with us here from Seattle. Jeff, welcome. And my good colleague, Prem Paul, the Vice Chancellor of Research and Economic Development at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Now, I get to sit down and observe, but before doing so, I get to introduce the person who will set the stage for our panel and make the introductions this afternoon, uh, Dr. Sam Meisels. Uh, Sam joined us uh, here uh, in 2013 as the founding executive director of the Buffett Early Childhood Institute at the University of Nebraska. After having an illustrious career in a number of institutions, including the University of Michigan, uh, Tufts University, and the Erickson Institute in Chicago, where he led that leading graduate program in early childhood development for over 10 years. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sam Meisels. Sam. Thank you, Dr. Green. I get to be, I was just introduced, and now I get to introduce some more people. And it's my great pleasure. I'm really looking forward to the presentations by these internationally known experts today as they discuss the topic we have today, the role of water and food security in early childhood survival and development, a global perspective. As Dr. Green mentioned, I'm the founding executive director of the Buffett Early Childhood Institute. Our institute was created to improve the lives of children and families, children from birth through age eight. Our focus is research, education, outreach, and policy that put, to be, that put to use the best practices for children and for their families, children particularly living in, in poverty. Our focus indeed is also on starting very locally in Nebraska, but we are quickly going to be thinking of this in terms of a national perspective and a global perspective. So that is one of the reasons that I'm very excited about today's panel. Good nutrition and good water in the first thousand days of a child's life 
are critical for optimum physical and brain development. Today's panel is addressing a vital topic that affects both individuals and the countries in which they live. I'm honored to have the pleasure of introducing the panel and in more or less alphabetical and more or less where they're sitting order. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about them. Dr. Chris Elias, who is uh, second to, uh, to last on, on the left, is president of the Global Development Program at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Dr. Elias leads the foundation's efforts in integrative and innovative delivery to create solutions and products that reach the hands of people in developing countries who need them the most. He oversees the foundation's global development portfolio in agricultural development, family planning, financial services for the poor, maternal, newborn, and child health, polio, vaccine delivery, and water sanitation, and hygiene. Dr. Elias's professional background is in health and medicine, and he is a former Omahan, as I've learned to say, um, with both an MD and an honorary doctor of science degree from Creighton University. He serves on several advisory boards, including those for the Nike Foundation and the Duke Global Health Institute. Dr. Joan Lombardi, second here to my left, is the former Deputy Assistant Director and Interdepartmental Liaison for Early Childhood Education in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. She's a senior advisor to the Buffett Early Childhood Fund and the Bernard Van Leer Foundation on Global Child Development Strategies. She also directs Early Opportunities, LLC, focusing on innovation, policy, and philanthropy. Dr. Lombardi has served in three different presidential administrations, and uh, for which she probably deserves some kind of commendation in itself, and was the first commissioner of the, of the Child Care Bureau, the founding director of the Birth to Five Policy Alliance, now known as the Alliance for Early Success, and the founder of Global Leaders for Young Children. She currently serves on the boards of uh, Save the Children and Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning. Dr. Nurper um, uh, Ulker is the former head of the Early Childhood Development uh, Unit and senior advisor for early childhood development at UNICEF. She started her career with UNICEF in Turkey in 1989. She moved to UNICEF headquarters in New York in late 2004 and has traveled the world assisting UNICEF regional and county offices in designing early childhood policies, programs, and advocacy materials, as well as conducting training for UNICEF staff and partners at country, regional, and global levels. Dr. Ulker retired in 2012 as head of the Early Childhood Development UNICEF, at, at, Unit at UNICEF. Before joining UNICEF, she was an associate professor and chair of child development at Gazi University in Ankara, Turkey, where she, where she lives today. Our panel moderators, and you're very fortunate to have two such wonderful moderators, are Dr. Marjorie Kostelnik, the dean of the College of Education and Human Sciences at UNL, and Dr. Helen Rakes, uh, professor, Willa Cather professor in the UNL Department of Child, Youth, and Family Studies. Please join me in welcoming the panel members and moderators for today's Her Herman Lecture. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon. It's very nice to see all of you. And on behalf of the Institute and the Herman Lecture Series, we'd like to welcome you and also thank you for being here. This is going to be a wonderfully exciting panel, and let me explain how it's going to work. We're going to, we've invited each of our speakers to speak for about 10 minutes to give you a snapshot of their unique perspective on the topic that's under discussion today. They're going to stay in their seats because we want this to be kind of informal, and we also want to give you a maximum opportunity to ask questions at the end. After each speaker, we will have a few questions that Helen and I have devised that we think might pull some threads together, and then we would like to invite questions from the audience. So I'm going to turn things over to Helen Ricks. Dr. Lombardi asked me to set a frame for our discussion here today. 
So I'll say again, our purpose is to explore the connections that exist among food security, water availability and quality, and children's development. The Hiraman Lectures have been exploring many aspects related to feeding the world in the future. Because of our agricultural emphasis as a university located at the heart of a major food production area, of course it is paramount, a paramount question to address the need to feed 9.6 billion people by the year 2050. And there have been many important talks focused on that question. Today, we talk about nutrition, survival, and capacity building of our children, who of course will be the labor force for the world population in the future. The food story is not just one of mouths to feed, but also a story of who the people are. Demographics are shifting, as we will hear. Second, we feature the fabulous Water for Food Institute here at the university and think about water availability and quality. Today, we think about the importance of water quality for children to thrive. Finally, in our Buffett Early Childhood Institute and our many early childhood endeavors, we strive to develop programs and processes that optimize child development. Of course, we now recognize the importance of the formative early years, and today we will see that we are saving more lives, but there is also a need to develop the full capacity of every child. We will discuss the need to pay attention to human capacity development even more for moral and practical reasons. Thus, food, water, child development, the development of human capacity in the earliest years is inextricably bound with food and water security. We will talk about connecting these today. We invite Dr. Joan Lombardi to provide her perspective on this topic, and then we will go immediately to Dr. Olker and Dr. Elias. Well, thank you, Helen. And um, I want you to help me thank Helen Rakes for her incredible leadership on all of these topics that deal with young children. Thank you. Um, she never misses an opportunity to integrate child development into any topic, and that's what I call a good advocate. Mm -hmm. I want you to look at this little person and imagine his life without water and sanitation. And you can, right from the start, um, know that, of course, these topics are totally linked. I want to talk about three things quickly in my time. Why I think the early years are so important. Some of the demographics both in, uh, globally and in the United States, and then a vision for moving forward. Um, this is my little grandson, so I have to always bring him with me. <laughs> um, so what we know about young children, and we know more than we've ever done, known before from a whole variety of uh, scientific disciplines, is that early experiences matter, that what happens in the early years is actually built into the architecture of the brain that it's not just what you're born with biology, but those early experiences that shape the developmental period, and that one developmental period builds on another, and that the domains of development are integrated. Now, many of you that are child development specialists, of course, know this, but that's exactly why we can't talk about health and education as if they're separate things. Um, we know that that early brain development begins to set the pathways that produce language and hearing later on. And it starts in that prenatal period. It actually starts in preconception with the health of the mother. And that human development is so critical to later development. This is um, just a slide of a study from the US about cognitive development um, for children nine months and 24 months that are in low, um, the difference between higher income families and lower income families. The, the point of this slide is that we start seeing the achievement gap in children at a very young age, starting at nine months and, and continuing to grow. So that if we want to intervene early, if we want to make a difference in a, children, in a child's health and education, we've got to start in the early years. We know, and many of you, sorry about this slide, it takes me a little bit and sometimes <laughs> it gets stuck. Um, we know that if you want to really pay attention to children's um, reading later on, that you've got to start with good vocabulary in the early years. This is children at 16 months, 24 months, 36 months, where we know the gap in the amount of vocabulary that children hear makes a difference by three low, lower income families, fa children from low income families know half the words that children at higher income families do. So of course you don't start out the same when you finally reach kindergarten. We know that it's not just the, um, the 
early experiences, but those early experiences uh, affecting education. But we now know, and a new study just came out from Jim Heckman a few weeks ago, reaffirming this. This is the data from the ACES study that the number of risk factors that children face in their young age ages affects cardiovascular disease years later. So there's a link again between early experiences and later health. Another reason why the, why the early years are so important. This is a study around nutrition and early stimulation that comes from Jamaica done several years ago where they looked at non-stunted children and compared them to children that were stunted where they, where they, <clears throat> they gave them early stimulation and better nutrition and it, in one group and they gave them nutrition only in another group and stimulation in another group. What made the difference? What brought those children almost to normal development when you combined nutrition and early stimulation? So these are natural allies we're talking about. Um, if you look at children in the poorest households around the world, this is UNICEF data that NERFR helped um, develop. Children 36 to 59 months. We know that that red line is, the, is, is showing the number, the percentage of children in, um, attending early childhood programs and the difference between high income children and low income children. So access to early childhood makes a difference. Let me turn to the U.S. again. Um, you know, I think one of the most surprising facts that we can talk about is the younger you are, the younger you are, the poorer you are in the United States. So children under three is some of the poorest children we have. We've got almost 50, 40 to 50 percent of our infants and toddlers living in low-income families. Nebraska is doing a little bit better than that. Um, if we look at children in poverty which is um, you know, obviously lower than low income, about half that. We've got one out of four children under three um, living in poverty, and a high percentage of children living in extreme poverty right here in the United States. If we look at um, this, um, if we look at breastfeeding by income, breastfeeding, which we know has clear benefits to young children, we know that, that we're seeing the frequency of breastfeeding, which we want to see <clears throat> in all families, lower in low-income families. So we've got to do special outreach to those children. If we look at relative poverty in 32 um, countries around the world, we see that the United States r ranks second to last. We can do better than that. That affects the developing child. If we look at maternity leave, in 38 developed countries around the world, the United States is the only one that does not require paid leave. Why is that important from a nutrition point of view? Because you are less likely to breastfeed, which we know is so important to the development of young children if you, don't, if you have to go back to work as soon as your child is, is born. So these, these policies are related to each other. Sorry that I'm having a little bit of trouble. So let me, ah, I switched for some reason this next slide. Oh, I'm going to end it there and turn this over to Nurper. But I had a few more slides. I, I just want to reinforce the importance. I, I, they must have disappeared. Yeah. No. To talk about the vision okay. that you have. Well, I mean, I think that the most important point that I want to make is the importance of the first 1,000 days. We've got a 1,000-day campaign going on internationally where we're really focusing on the health and nutrition of children around the world. Um, we know that there's 130 million children about born a year. We've made dramatic increases in child survival. We're all very proud of that. We still know that the majority of children that are continue to die, which is about you know, uh, 7 million children around the world, are dying because of lack of good sanitation and adequate um, hygiene and adequate access to water. So we've still got a, a ways to go. But we've got 200 million children um, around the world under five that are surviving, but they're not thriving. And so we've got to be concerned with their well-being as well as being concerned with, with children that are surviving. So I'll <coughs> stop there. Thank you. Probably have my slide. <laughs> you lost well, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Good afternoon. And uh, it's a pleasure to be with you here. And 
I'm delighted to be among these wonderful people. And I have special thanks to Helen Riggs, who brought me here all the way from Turkey. Thank you, <laughs> Helen. And, uh, and to talk about child development, which is the closest to my heart. I'd like to start where uh, John has uh, only the, paved the way for me. And my, to uh, my presentation will be more how we could place the early childhood development on the discussion of post-2015 development agenda, which is currently being discussed at different uh, platforms. Um, I would like to start with the global vision for child development. That comes from, first of all, Convention on the Rights of the Child, that all children should survive and develop their full potential. But then also in 2002, when all the member states get uh, signed and adopted the Declaration on World Fit for Children, that starts saying that all children should get the best start in life. This is what John was saying, to be physically healthy, mentally alert, socially competent, emotionally sound, uh, ready to learn. This is something, the vision that we have for all children. We want to see all children doing this. And they should go to school and able to learn and get additional support whenever they need it if they are disabled, marginalized, and caught in conflict. But we know that this is not the reality. We, don't, we have this vision for all children, but children are not developing their full potential. OK, we have moved from 12 million children to 6.6 .6 million children in terms of infant mortality rate, child mortality rate which is great, it's a great progress, which makes us even more responsible now, and it is a moral imperative, what will happen to those children and how they are going to develop their full potential. And there are risk factors like poverty, poor health, nutrition, environment, lack of stimulation and learning. Usually when it comes to poverty or poor health and nutrition, we more or less know what we can do. This is exactly because we have the indicators. When it comes to early stimulation, quite often we don't know what to do with it because what is early stimulation? Last, year, there, last week there was this wonderful conference at the Institute of Medicine. They started talking about, are you singing to your child, talking to your child, reading to, uh, reading to your child? These are very simple cost effect, uh, no cost activities, but if you didn't do it, it will cost a lot to us later on. That comes from Heckman's e equilibrium. I would like to share only one slide. Uh, already uh, John Lombardi shared one. These, these are a series of slides from UNICEF Multiple Indicators Cluster Survey, really uh, putting the child into context, especially young children. And, you could, and more data is coming up. If you check the website, uh, we can give you the link. Now, 60 countries, we collect information about the situation of children and developmental outcomes. For example, if you look at Yemen, almost 80% of children are left home alone or under the supervision of another child. That is an important part of, when we talk about brain development, adversities is important. These are the children who will be, uh, these are the children who will be not read stories or sang songs. These are the children who will fall into wells or drown or burned because of accidents. These are the children might be going hungry all day because there is no responsible adult who will be feeding them responsibly, appropriately, and sensitively. So we have to do something for those children. But we also know what to do with these children. We already have quite a good experience and knowledge coming from developing world as well as from developed world. The Lancet series in 2011 already came up with two very clear models for early childhood development programs. One of them is talking for the first 03, how we could mainstream, we, we could mainstream early stimulation into existing community-based maternal health, nutrition, and child development intervention and it uh, produces results. In fact, this is actually the result of the paper, uh, the line, uh, Sally McGregor's study on nutrition and ECD. Well, I'll come back to that. And that's why we, we know that it works. And the second one is community-based preschool uh, centers. So these are the two models that we should be working on. And Integration of ECD into nutrition and health program. 
We already know it. It's a 20 years of knowledge and experience. But there's one more experience is coming from Pakistan, led by Aga Khan University. And there are three groups, exactly the same slide that John showed. And ECD and children in the ECD and nutrition group together, not only ECD, early stimulation or nutrition, significantly benefited from mother and child interaction and had less morbidity. That means less diarrhea, less pneumonia, and had greater benefits. We are following these children now. They are five years old, and soon they will be in primary school. And these ECD interventions also benefited the poorest children most, because they need that kind of info, uh, support. And it also reduced maternal depression, which is very important also for us. OK, if you think about all these things, then we, we know that child care is important. But quite often, when we look at the child care, uh, yes, you're right. The slides are cut. Um, OK. Uh, what I was uh, talking about here, that when we talk about early childhood development programs, we mainly focus on women and women and childcare. Quite often this is related to, uh, then of course we talk about mothers, then it really has an impact on mothers' uh, employment, employment opportunities. And if we are talking about, for example, agriculture, and there was a very good slide that I'm, I'm going to read from here. It's not there, I don't know why. And it was from, uh, actually, the IFAD president. The, uh, it was a message coming from the IFAD president that we need women in agriculture. OK, now, because we are talking about agriculture and water and sanitation and food security. And now, more and more, we would like to see them more involved in agriculture or f formal sector. If we did this, these women will be leaving their children behind. OK, we don't want to link women and child care because women have the right to be employed. But on the other hand, we don't want to have this at the expense of children left behind or under the supervision of another child, usually the girl child. So it is important that we should talk about child care policies. These child care policies should be integrated into all kinds of interventions. And affordable, feasible, quality early childhood care programs should be part of, an integral part of all, all kinds of interventions, including agricultural interventions and water. I just had this one slide here, although I had other slides. Uh, it is the child care in Sri Lanka tea plantations. And if you look at it, on, on the one that on the, on the left, it's a beautiful community-based childcare in the tea plantation. The mothers and fathers, they go up to the hills to pick teas while they, they are have, the children are having their daycare. And you can see the group work. And the center is also used for uh, educating and training caregivers, mothers and fathers and families on water quality environmental sanitation, etc. And if, if you could see the last one, it is the nurses. These are home visiting nurses making plans to visit homes and to make sure that those children are getting and the families are getting support. So this childcare and similar ones that come from Peru, India, Mongolia, for example, had a wonderful their kindergarten, which is a kind of tent that follows nomadic children around. How all these things fit into the post-2015 agenda, if we really believe that early childhood care and education should be an integral part of the sustainable development agenda, how we are going to fit it into it? We've been working on it very hard. John has been leading it. And uh, we have so many uh, different platforms to advocate for early childhood development to be part of the post-2015 agenda. In fact, this is also another opportunity for us to voice the importance of early childhood care and education to be an integral part of post-2015 agenda. Post-2015 agenda is a process. It started in 2002 and will continue until end of 2016. And there will be so many different discussions to really create the world for for all, us, for all of us to live now and beyond 15. 
The sustainable development agenda, now we have this framework, has three important elements. Building on human rights and equity. It is inclusive economic development, inclusive social development, and sustainable environment, and peace and security. And what happened is that during the last one and a half years, since 2012, this report was published, there were so many different discussions, and we have come up with, finally, the Open Working Group, which was the UN Open Working Group, the, which has representatives from different governments, all the governments, in fact, have come up with 19 focus areas. Uh, we have just handed out to you. And uh, to see how early, uh, and these focus areas are about shaping the world we want for us uh, after 2015. And I have just made a kind of comments how early childhood care and development should fit into each focus areas. Education does well, but not the others. I'm not going to go into details of this because we might have more time to discuss later on. But I have taken one more step on what should be, how we could integrate early childhood care and educa ed education into uh, a sustainable agriculture, food security, and nutrition in the post-2015 framework and the goal that was proposed by the Bill, Bill, Bill Gates Foundation, Melinda and Bill Gates Foundation, as a discussion paper last month. I just looked at that one. And they have come up with six wonderful targets to eliminate hunger and ensure food security and good nutrition. Eliminate hunger by 2030. Elimination of malnutrition in early childhood is an excellent indicator that we should all be looking at. But then, when we look at agricultural productivity, and increasing agricultural productivity, especially involving women, we need to talk about early childhood care and education. So those red ones are proposed indicators to the targets. Just because it's a discussion paper, we can still work on that. Environmental sustainability is fine, and opportunities for smallholder farmers, attention to gender equity, coming back to the earlier discussion that childcare is not only women's uh, issue, but it becomes when it comes to the reality. Increase access to quality childcare and education among agricultural workers, especially women with young children, should be part of that target. And an indicator should be developed. And we have those indicators and measures already that we can uh, provide. And finally, target, uh, target six, nutrition security and reducing stunting by 50% should definitely include an indicator, increased prevalence of responsive, sensitive feeding practices integrated in, in ECD nutrition intervention. So this is something that we need to look into and how we could bring early childhood development, care and education into the post-2015 agenda and make it part of the uh, equilibrium. We believe that sustainable development starts with children and starts very early, right from the beginning. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you, Keith, to you and your family for your generosity in convening us today for this important discussion. And thank you, Helen, to you and your colleagues here at the University of Nebraska for inviting me back. It's great to be back in Nebraska. Um, and what I'd like to do is share with you a little bit, and let me say thank you to, to Joan and Nerper for actually giving you all the background that I'm gonna try and use as a platform for talking about what we at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation are trying to do about some of this. You know, the Gates Foundation starts from the premise that everyone deserves a chance at a healthy and productive life. And what that means is that we really do have to put children at the center of the agenda. Um, if you, uh, for those of you who may not be as familiar with the Gates Foundation, we have sort of four programs. Our U.S. programs, which are 15 to 20 percent of our activities and represent, um, you know, work primarily in the education sector. But 80 percent or so of our programs are really global, and they focus on global health, Global development, which includes um, work in agricultural development, financial services for the poor, water sanitation, hygiene, um, and a few other areas. 
and also our global policy and advocacy work, which is very important because this is a picture, if you can see it, of Bill Gates with an incredibly diverse group of people on stage at the Global Vaccine Summit a year ago in Abu Dhabi, where we helped to convene a global conversation about how to finish the job in getting life-saving vaccines to all the children in the world, and particularly in this, in this instance, to actually raise the resources necessary to completely eradicate polio from the face of the earth. It would be the only the second disease that we've, uh, we've managed to do that for. So at the Gates Foundation, we try to combine these programs in an important way to work in partnership with universities, with the UN system, with civil society around the world to accomplish some of the, some of the big solutions to big challenges that, that uh, Joan and Nerpa have talked about. This is my favorite slide, um, and just watch it come down, right? This is over the last 50 years, every year for the last 50 years, the number of children dying before their fifth birthday has come down, and it's come down dramatically from 20 million children in 1960 to less than 7 million in 2012. And this is data from the UNICEF State of the World's Children Report. The rates, the drop in child mortality rates are even more dramatic. So we still have 6.6 .6 children 6.6 .6 million children dying before their fifth birthday, which is too much, entirely too much. If the rates in poor countries were the same as in rich countries, that number globally would be more in the one million range. So we've got work to do, but we've made incredibly good progress. As, you, as those of you who may have read Bill Melinda Gates's annual letter this year, it was about the good news story of global health and development and how the investments that we as a global community have made in improved um, health, improved agricultural productivity, et cetera, have paid off, and they've paid off in terms of the health and livelihoods of people around the world. As we've made this progress, we've been able to look more carefully at the places where we're not making as much progress. So while the overall child mortality has declined, and we've seen a decline in neonatal mortality, that is the number of deaths of children in their first month of life. Um, we've made progress, but we've made less steady progress. So that now, 44%, we're soon approaching half of the children who die, die within their first month of life. In fact, a million children die on the day they're born. And that's unacceptable. So as we've made progress, we've begun to see where we're lagging and where we need to focus our attention. And one of the areas which you've heard about already is stunting. This is one of the most stubborn problems that we face in global health and development. And this chart is, it takes a little bit of, of looking at this, because we have made progress. But if you look regionally, we've made most of our project in, in progress in places that have rap, been, been experiencing rapid economic growth, specifically Asia. If you look at the bottom portion of this bar, which is Sub-Saharan Africa, the numbers of stunted children in Sub-Saharan Africa have actually been going up. Now, the rates are going down a little bit, but because of population growth, the absolute numbers of stunted children have been going up. And this is a tragedy. Now, you know, we've had a 50% decrease in the under, uh, under five mortality, but we've only had about a third of a percent uh, decrease in the rates of stunting. And again, we've seen a concentration, particularly in very poor places like Sub-Saharan Africa. So we have now have 165 million children who are stunted, um, under five who are stunted as of 2011. And we know that that's not just physical stunting. It's often permanent effects on the brain and neurocognitive development, school achievement, economic productivity, the kinds of things that you've heard from, from Joan and Nerper. And it's also predictive of poor reproductive health outcomes. There's a sort of intergenerational effect. Women who are stunted as children often have higher obstetrical complications, and that tragedy of numbers goes on uh, across generations. So we need to think about how we address some of these problems that are thornier than some of the other ones. We've made great progress in reducing child mortality with innovations like vaccines or rehydration salts to, produ to, to save children from dying, dying from diarrheal disease, better, uh, vac uh, better antibiotics, et cetera. But when it comes to this challenge of stunting, both physical and cognitive stunting, we're making some progress, but not nearly as much as we need to. So how do we think about this at the Gates Foundation? This is an area where, more than almost anything else, we're trying to work in an integrated way across our programs to look at the contributions of water and sanitation, 
agricultural development, nutrition, and the broader set of interventions in maternal and child health, including vaccines against diarrheal diseases, pneumonia, et cetera. So let me just go through these a little bit and, and talk about some of the challenges. Our water and sanitation program focuses on, primarily on sanitation, because if you look at the Millennium Development Goal indicators that NERPA mentioned, um, we've made better progress on safe water availability than we have much better progress than we have on sanitation. And unfortunately, our focus on sanitation has been um, really about getting people to use toilets, which is important because if people don't use toilets, we know that the consequences of de open defecation in communities are, are, are tremendous, especially for young children. But one of the things we've discovered is that simply getting people toilets isn't enough. We actually have to look at the whole service chain of sanitation because if, the toilet, if people use a toilet but the, the fecal sludge isn't managed, we have a problem. So if you take, for example, this is the situation in Dhaka, Bangladesh, the capital of Bangladesh, very dense urban area. Only 1% of people in Dhaka actually defecate openly. 99% use toilets. Unfortunately, most of those toilets are not safely emptied. They overflow into the environment so that you get actually about 70% of the fecal sludge winds up in the urban environment, even if though it starts in a toilet. And then even the 20% that's connected to a sewer mostly leaks out or doesn't get treatment. So that on an analysis, in this case done by the World Bank, only 2% of the waste, the fecal waste in, in Bangladesh is actually safely treated. So we've been focused in sanitation about toilets. And we're, we have a big initiative at the Gates Foundation on reinventing the toilet. Um, which I can talk to you about if you want to know more about that. But, um, but this is a problem, right? We have to actually look at the complexity of the problem. How do we make sure we're thinking about sanitation all the way uh, from toilets to safe disposal? If we think about what's working in nutrition, again, we're learning a lot. Joan mentioned this. It starts preconception. We're now understanding that maternal nutrition, we have some powerful interventions for micronutrient supplementation and growth monitoring, et cetera, to improve maternal nutrition. But if we really want to prevent children, and about 20% of children are born already with stunting behind the curve of growth. So we have to begin by improving nutrition for adolescent girls and young women before they get pregnant. We have to pay attention to maternal nutrition, exclusive and early breastfeeding, the most natural, the most inexpensive, one of the most effective nutritional interventions we have, not just in terms of saving people's kids' lives, but in improving their neurocognitive outcomes, is absolutely essential. And we're beginning to learn what it takes to move some of that graph that Joan showed you of breastfeeding rates. Um, and we've seen, for instance, in places like Bangladesh in the last couple of years with some innovative approaches, 30% increases in the rates of exclusive breastfeeding. And similar experiences in Ethiopia and Vietnam, et cetera. Infant and young child nutrition, after a child is exclusively bre breastfed for six months, then supplementing their complementary foods so that we get the maximal development in this 1,000-day period. The 1,000 days going from conception through the child's second birthday. We still need to make sure they will have access to good nutritious food after that. But that 1,000-day window is particularly critical because if you're stunted at two years of age, we can continue to work and support you and, and that, but you won't reach your full potential. So we need early intervention, and we know what needs to be done. We just need to know how to deliver it. An important part of our program, and agricultural development is one of our largest programs in the Global Development Program, is focusing on nutrition-sensitive agriculture. Um, we all know, and certainly here in Nebraska, you know that agriculture plays a very vital role in defeating hunger and, and preventing poverty around the world. Increased agricultural productivity, which is an important part of our focus, has, it leads to greater food availability, so people have more food security. But they also, and it, and it helps to lower prices for them, particularly in poor countries. But it also helps to have them generate income. And since the majority of smallholder farmers in places like Sub-Saharan Africa are women, we know that with better income, the first place they invest that is in better health and education for their children. Recently, we've invested significant um, resources in the development of biofortified foods, the orange flesh sweet potato, um, high iron beans. I was in Rwanda a few weeks ago, and the, uh, through our collaborators at Harvest Plus, we've, they've recently introduced a set of uh, a varieties of, of high iron beans in Rwanda, which not only have higher iron content that meet 
the, the iron needs of, of antenatal women and children, but have 50% increases in yield. And so the uptake of those varieties, now 25% of, of Rwandan farmers that are, that are growing beans are growing biofortified beans with higher iron. And again, you've heard it before, that women are at this nexus of agriculture, nutrition, health. So this is my last slide, and really is about a new initiative that we've put together at the Gates Foundation, focused on healthy birth, growth, and development. Because again, we're making great progress in our vaccine work and, our, and many other areas. But the area that's lagging is this issue of, this complex issue of stunting, where it's a combination of environmental, sanitation, high diarrheal disease rates, Diarrheal disease is often the second most common cause of death among children under the age of five in many of the poorest countries. Better nutrition, better immunity, et cetera. And it reflects how little we know. And there's a recent Lancet publication that said, if we took the 10 things that we know work the best to prevent stunting, and we reached 90% coverage in the 34 highest burden uh, countries, we would still only address about 20% of the problem. We need to understand this problem better. We need to understand the interactions between immunity, between nutrition, between um, the quality of food and the quantity of food. And so this is an area across all of our disciplines, across the ag space, nutrition, our, our childhood, maternal and child health programs, that we're bringing together to both understand it better so that we can then rapidly deploy interventions that can help to solve this problem. Because again, it's mostly a good news story in terms of global development. But we now need to pay attention to where we're lagging. In this area of, of um, early uh, development and, and uh, nutrition is an important one. So thank you. Well, as you can see, we've brought three very different perspectives together here. A person who has spent most of her uh, professional life working in government and in the, United, in the United States government in agencies, a person who has spent most of her professional life working internationally, and a person who is currently working with a private foundation. So we have many different groups who are uh, looking at this issue in a very ecological way. You might have wondered when you first came in here, how were we going to tie water, food, and children into one thing, beside the fact that we have institutes in all of those things? And I hope that you've been able to see that in fact it is a very tight fit between children not only surviving but thriving and the status of water and food in their environment. So we're just going to ask two or three questions of our panel to give them a chance to kind of react a little bit to one another, and then we're going to ask you for some questions. But the first thing I'd like to start with is to ask you about the fact that here in Nebraska, we think a lot about food in particular. We've, the Institute for Ag and Natural Resources, as well as the university, has devoted itself to the notion of feeding the billions that are coming along and doing it in a very efficient and effective way. And that would affect or relate to all of the things you've been talking about. So at this point, is there anything else that you'd like us to think about in terms of early nutrition and child development? Anything else from each of your perspectives or in looking at one another's perspectives, you see some connections that you'd like to make sure come to our attention? Well, you know, what strikes me when I listen to the whole conversation is if we really want to promote good nutrition, we have to use every platform that's available to us. Mm -hmm. And that means community health workers globally, preschools, every setting where children are. And I'm not sure that we're doing that to the extent that we could. I still hear about preschool programs that are not integrating nutrition. I still see community health workers that don't talk about parenting and early stimulation and, and responsive, responsive uh, breastfeeding and responsive parenting. So I think that the, the picture for me is how do we use the existing platforms to get these messages out, particularly in the first thousand days. To me, it's all about the first thousand days. Okay, okay I'd like to be more provocative. 
<laughs> and um, first of all, thank you very much. It was a great presentation, especially the last slide on growth and development new project, which is really promising. And then you had said very nicely that we still want to understand the undernutrition, problems of undernutrition, and then you went on health, nutrition, etc. I think the etc. is the one that we should be tackling. And that etc. is all about this interaction between the caregiver and the mother, right with the child, right from the beginning. And quite often, all these nutrition programs do not include that two important sentences or words sensitive and responsive feeding. Mm -hmm. these, are, these are the key words, and it, is, it changes the whole world. Because if, and we're talking about mother who's depressed, who's undernourished, who's, and we have a program already with UNICEF, UNICEF and WHO, we developed this care for child development, which is a kind of integration, coming back to John's uh, integration how we, are, we can integrate these wonderful two messages into home visiting nurses program for health and nutrition. And it makes a big difference. It, it does. We know it. So, and it can be translated into responsive and sensitive feeding. And it is there, for example, coming from, and, uh, from the UK uh, declaration on 1,000 day, the, the government has made it. I was so delighted to see that they have included the responsive and sensitive feeding. We need to see this globally. And that makes perhaps contribute, I think, and it can contribute to improving the nutritional level of children and also interaction, bonding, and attachment that we know. The psychologists know all these things. Please listen to us a little bit more. <laughs> Chris? Um, I, we will listen to you more, <laughs> even, though, even though my comment's going to seem like it goes in the other direction. Uh, I spent some time this morning with colleagues at the, uh, at the Institute for Agriculture and Natural Resources and saw some of the new uh, laboratory space that's being added um, in the Morrison Building. And it reminds me that, and heard a bit about some of the work that's being done on, on gut enteropathy, which is really at this nexus of of the microbiome, nutrition, inflammation, immunity. And one of the challenges we have is that we don't have good measures. Right? We're talking about stunting. Stunting is height for age. It's, you know, it's a very crude measure. Um, I think you know, here at the University of Nebraska and many other academic centers, we're now applying the newest science in genomics and proteomics to actually understanding what some of the markers are of mm. gut dysfunction, of growth, et cetera. And I think as we define better measures, we'll be able to refine our interventions and our research. Mm, that's um, and that's, that's going to allow us to track progress in a way that is much more refined than the, the rather crude way we do it now. Um, now, as we do that, I think, Nerpa, to your point, that we will begin to actually understand better the, the complex interaction between the social factors and the biological yeah, factors. Exactly. I think that's partly been underappreciated, and I agree with you that it has been underappreciated because we haven't actually been able to measure it. Mm -hmm. um, I think in the discussions I'm sometimes in, it feels like a good to have rather than a have to have. And I think as we get better at measuring our progress against the problem we're trying to solve, we'll see that it's actually a have to have. And, you know, I just want to agree with him. The measurement is critical. But I think we really, if we're really after behavior change, if we look at the issues of nutrition in the U.S. for children under three, we know there's a lack of understanding about what is complementary feeding. Um, we know that the most common vegetable that children at 12 to 15 months are eating is a French fry. We know that's not the right, <laughs> that's not the right direction. So. As, as we measure, we also have a lot of work to do to be able to translate what we know into public messages that we can communicate to families Good. if we want to address these things, at least here in the U.S. Okay. Good. 
Great comments on nutrition. We'd like to talk about water for a few minutes now. You know, we can talk about the elements or we can look at the outcomes and work our way backwards. And in some ways, we're kind of going in both directions. But let's take water. We do have the Water for Food Institute here. And yet, perhaps many of us do not think of water quality as being a factor in children's development every day. But we're seeing those connections do exist. So is there anything else that you want to say about the connections between water quality and access and early development? You know, I can't imagine separating them. I, you know, I come out of Head Start. Um, in Head Start, we link all these things. And, you know, if you ever try to run any kind of early childhood programs without access to water, you know that the, the sanitation issues, besides the basic nutritional issues, the sanitation issues, the hygiene issues, all of those affect development. So, you know, water is the issue of the future. We know that. It's going to get to be more and more of an issue. And so it's going to affect the development of children. And I don't think we can separate it. Yeah, all I do is add that I think that we've made some progress on water, but I think we have to remember the context in some of the poorest countries. So if you take, um, um, you know, you take Sub-Saharan Africa, you have a rapidly urbanizing population. Many of the people in these urban settlements aren't even counted when we look at progress on the Millennium Development Goals. But if you look at the rates of, for instance, in Kenya, the diarrheal disease rates in Nairobi are higher than they are in the rural areas. Partly because while there's access to water, that water, you know, it's to, to John's point, you can't really disconnect the water from the sanitation. If you don't have good sanitation, the water gets contaminated. And even if it's periodically tested, it, you know, it's not enough, especially if it's in an informal urban settlement, and there are many, many of them that aren't technically even on the map. But, that's, but there's millions of people living there, and they're suffering the consequences of this poor connection of, of they may have enough water, but it's, it's, you know, they've got, you know, the sanitation system leaking into the, to the, the water sources. I'd like to have Thank a you. different, yeah, this, just while listening to you, John and uh, Chris, I also was thinking, how are we going to, <clears throat> first of all, use of water, clean, uh, washing hands, are habitual. We all learn it right from the beginning. So how we are going to, as early childhood education people here in the room as well, how we are going to develop this attitude towards first washing our hands, which is very important, mm -hmm. and uh, cleaning the water, making sure that the water is clean. And now, for example, in early childhood programs, we should be tackling these things and teaching our ch uh, young children on that. And finally, saving the water. Years ago, it just reminded me, years ago we were doing a uh, water hand washing video with kindergarten children. And all these children were in front of the beautiful running water and uh, continually washing their hands and singing songs. And then I was so frightened to see that the water was going down and wasting. Uh, they're wasting the water. And I said, this video cannot be shown because <laughs> We are wasting water while the children are washing their hands. So I think early childhood education programs can make a great impact on developing the concept of saving water, washing hands, and also cleaning the water. So this is another contribution from the early childhood programs. I want to acknowledge um, a couple of my graduate students who prepared a poster and did a lot of, of background work in exploring connections between water, food, and sanitation and other elements and children's development. So uh, Gentry and Amy are sitting in the, in the second row here. But there's also a handout that represents the work they did. And one of the studies that I think it's important to highlight here is a study um, done by uh, somebody by the name of Spears who looked at latrine density in India and found that to be highly correlated, highly related to uh, children's stunting. And so it wasn't even through diarrhea diseases, but subclinical kinds of concerns that were associated with the water and children's stunting, so from population studies. So I think how water plays into the picture affects us in many ways. I don't know if you want to comment any more on that. Well, no, I mean, it's just, it's, it's a big problem. I was in India a month ago. We, we, the Gates Foundation held something called the 
the reinvent the toilet fare. Uh -huh. So we're back we've, to <laughs> we've, uh, we've done this global challenge to get people to reinvent the toilet, right? Because the, 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 the toilet we're used to, where you flush a gallon of water um, every time it's used, mm -hmm. is really not scalable or sustainable in much of the world, where you know, currently 2.5 billion people of the 7 billion people don't have access to a safe toilet. So we're going to need a better technology to get, uh, uh, to get full access. And so we've, we've challenged the engineering. It's been very interesting because it's brought together very multidisciplinary collaborations to put together, you know, our goal is a self-contained toilet where basically the waste gets processed and deodorized and disinfected on site. And ideally, we can recover um, uh, um, uh, the extrinsic value of the human waste chain, as that my colleagues <laughs> like to call it. Uh, Who knew? <laughs> you know, um, and, uh, you know, for biochar, biofuels, mm -hmm. nitrogen, other things for fertilizer, there are some valuable contents. Uh, even, you know, uh, clean water can be recovered in some, some, uh, some of these applications. But we were there, and in the context of this toilet fair, um, um, we, you know, we were together with the Department of Biotechnology of, of the government of India, and you know, I was at a, a dinner with him where he made a speech where he said, you know, basically 625 million people in India don't have access to a safe toilet, which is roughly half the country, um, which is, you know, stunning. And, mm -hmm. and then you look at the stunting rates. And stunting. It's also stunting. <laughs> you know, so, you know, we have to solve this problem, and we're going to need new um, uh, technologies, new innovations, but at the same time, in rural areas in particular, we have to have these community-led total sanitation programs to end the practices of, of open defecation um, in these communities. So it's, a lot of times it gets framed, and too often it gets framed as one approach or another, whereas what we really need is the full range of approaches and to integrate them with other community uh, interventions, as Nurper was saying, with hygiene and, um, and other healthy behaviors for young children. The great thing I got to do, I should have brought them along, at the toilet fair last month in India, I got to introduce a new Muppet, um, mm -hmm. who you may see, Raya, who's a six-year-old who teaches children how to wash their hands and to how to use the toilet appropriately. <laughs> you know, it strikes me as we're talking, all of these things that are being described as, obviously they have to be scaled up to a very large scale but they all really begin in the microsystem of the home and of the immediate caregiving of young children, no matter where they are in the world. Mm -hmm. And that often the people who carry out these tasks that really teach this very essential learning to young children are not uh, held in very high esteem. These are seen as menial tasks, but really they're life-saving tasks. And it makes me realize that as I work, for instance, with early childhood providers, I need to do a much better job of helping them understand the real life-saving uh, capacities mm -hmm. that they Good are uh, helping children to acquire. So just something for us to think about. Uh, what I was wondering is if now it might be a good time to ask the audience for some questions. We, we have more questions in case you have none, but my guess is you have some. So we would like to ask you, um, are there microphones in the audience, I understand? Yes? Yes, yes? Right here, Jill it has a microphone and Judy has one here. Are there some questions that you might like to ask? Yes. Right here, Jill. Mark. Yes. Uh, as you talked, you you mentioned a number number of critical things uh, that that are important if we're going to create an environment where a child can reach its full potential. Great. And those of us in associated with universities, and I think it's also true in government. I'm not so sure about the nonprofit world. I uh, like to, to, to find things in specialties and fields. Mm -hmm. And there were, there were a number of them mentioned, whether it's education, uh, sanitation, clean water, uh, nutrition, and all those sorts of things. But it seems to me that, that, uh, that maybe a, a more holistic approach where, where you put together 
teams that work on all these things, because you can improve the sanitation, for example, in a community, and if these other things don't exist, uh, you know, you may not have moved the bar tremendously. So I just was wondering uh, your, your thoughts on this and uh, whether you can give some examples of places where teams across the spectrum that have been talked about uh, have been put in place. Well, you know, I think it's you know, actually exactly the right point. For families, they're dealing with all of these issues at the same time. Children are growing up being affected by all these issues at the same time. So I think where we see the most promise is where communities come together to solve these problems in an integrated way, working off of the various platforms. Um, and you know, I'm sure that my colleagues have some great examples um, around the world. Here in the US, we've got communities working together around young children's issues and looking at development, you know, healthy births and how are kids thriving at three and how are they succeeding at five and coming together in innovative ways that I've never seen before with health and education coming together, social protection, working with education and health. So I think that message that you're, you're underscoring that Yuri Brofenbrotter taught about us about so many years ago that children grow up in families and families live in communities and that's how we should be addressing these problems is exactly the direction that we have to go in. And I'm sure you've got lots of examples. Yes, thank you very much for the question. This is exactly what we should be really looking at. And especially when we talk about integrated early childhood development programs, this is in, at the, in the community. We, are, we, are, we usually use the mantra, it takes a village to raise a child. So this is exactly what we should be doing. We have to develop this. And there are examples. For example, community-based childcare centers seem to be one of the models that UNICEF, WH, uh, UNICEF and also Save the Children and others have been using and uh, promoting in so many different countries, including Africa and uh, Asia. And for example, in Malawi, there are uh, community-based centers where from zero to six years of age, children can have some access to group learning activities. But also this, these are the centers where health workers, exactly similar to what I tried to show in the picture in Sri Lanka, health workers also map out the problems in the community and plan them their uh, home visits or parents come in and have some discussions or parenting programs are designed. There are some good examples around. What happens is that, for example, going back to Malawi, we had been working on this, there were 6,000 those community-based centers. And uh, the, this is the concept, to really mobilize the community and work together with the community and make community really its own owned uh, system. Um, they need 10,000, so first of all, 4,000 short of those centers. Second, if you go to those centers, most of those centers are very poor quality. So there are two important issues that we might be looking into. How are we going to improve their quality? Coming back to your question. And how are we going to make them available and accessible by all these communities that they need the same kind of services? And how this could be then sustainable? And how is it going to be not any more dependent on external resources, but they will develop their own resources. These are the things that we need to start thinking. And there are some examples, for example, again, going back to social protection policies and cash transfers. We, we know that World Bank has been giving a lot of money, I know that $8 billion or something, to, so, uh, to this cash transfer in different countries. How we could use this, some of that money to improve the situation of these community-based interventions which really bring that integrated programs to scale and reach out to the most advantage, disadvantaged group. Thank you for the question. This is exactly what we should be talking about. Yeah, I think you hit on a very important, um, it's almost a philosophical issue related to our progress in global health and development. I think we've, if you look again where we've made the most rapid progress, it's been where we've been able to 
take an existing disciplinary science and excel, right? So in a lot of that reduction in child mortality is from improved vaccines. So we've been able to greatly reduce child mortality as a result of vaccine preventable disease by applying vaccinology and microbiology within a pretty, pretty much within an existing set of disciplinary boundaries. The problems that remain as we make that progress are the ones that defy our, that aren't adequately addressed within our disciplinary boundaries. When we put out this challenge for the reinvent the toilet, um, you know, we have, we see incredible teams come together of engineers, design people, you know, uh, chemists, you know, people who wouldn't normally have worked together. Our Healthy Birth Growth and Development Initiative involves immunologists, neuroscientists, imaging specialists, people who are looking at how do we actually measure the brain development of, of young children, nutritionists, psychologists who actually know how, you know, to, you know, are helping us learn how to evaluate cognitive skills of very early children. So actually for these tough problems where progress is lagging, I actually think we absolutely need an interdisciplinary approach because to some extent they're lagging, not, not for lack of attention, they're lagging because the way we've organized our inquiry to find solution has not been successful. So we have to break out of those disciplinary boundaries to solve these big problems. That, that's been one of the challenges with mm -hmm. the Millennium Development Goals that we're still thinking in sectors mm -hmm. rather right. than thinking in a life course perspective about how do we integrate those things into development across the life course. You know, I'd like to mention um, when the university was thinking about what the putting together the Buffett Early Childhood Institute, we did an experiment. Uh, we found that everyone around the table who was initially planning this institute were all the people that normally talk to each other uh, from the four campuses, uh, all the early childhood people. So we invited colleagues that we didn't normally talk to. So for example, I brought an architect, someone else brought an entomologist, another person brought a criminologist, and we brought all these different disciplines together that don't normally talk about early childhood issues. And we posed a problem. What would you do about bullying on the playground? And everybody had a chance from their disciplinary point of view. No fair just talking about what you thought as a parent or a grandparent or someone who had seen something, but from your own discipline, what would the solutions be? How would you begin to approach this problem? And what we discovered were very inventive, very, we talk about being out of the box, but this was genuinely things that we had not initially thought of at all. And it really helped drive the development of the Buffett Early Childhood Center but the other thing that it did is it really reminded all of us around the table that you don't always have the solution ahead of time so that you know who to invite, so that you know who to ask. And it's one of the real challenges at a university to start talking to people when you don't really know what the outcome will be. And that it isn't a waste of time to do that. In fact, it's very productive intellectual time. And it's one of the things that universities can do that often people in other disciplines or other walks of life can't do. It's one of the real uh, treasures of being at a university. So we're hoping that in seeing this array of people, you and seeing all these different approaches, it will give us not only the encouragement, but the courage to really start to talk across disciplines around some of these very, very critical problems. And that was really part of the impetus for this particular conversation. As I'm looking at the time, I realized, Dr. Green, I was supposed to have said, come on up uh, for this portion of the program. Uh, we're doing okay? All right. We'd like to ask one, is there one last question that anyone here might like to ask? One last. Do I see one over here? Yes? I have one yeah, last. I'm, I'm interested in uh, the views that the Gates Foundation holds and as well other global organizations on population growth, curbing population growth and its relationship to resources, particularly for early childhood development, whether it's something that will take care of itself with resource uh, management or whether it's something that we can actually address to 
make more resources available for um, a smaller number of young children, particularly in re uh, resource-starved areas. Sure, shall I go? Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, we're, we've got, what, seven billion people on the planet? We're on our way to nine plus. Mm -hmm. um, and that much of that growth that's curr currently projected is actually momentum. It relates to the fact that we've got a very young age population. Uh, we've got about half of the planet is under 24 years of age. So even if um, everyone, you know, every couple had 2.1 children or replacement fertility, we'd still go to 9 billion. So we're, we're um, uh, but if we don't meet the needs of women and families, uh, the, the expressed and desired needs of women and families for access to safe, effective, voluntary contraception will go significantly beyond 9 billion. We'll go closer to 10 or above. Um, there's currently estimated to be about 225 million women in the world who want to control the timing and number of their children and don't have um, access to the means to do so. So this is not about you know, coercing anybody or, or, or making them do something they don't want. There's 225 million women who, according to surveys well done and well replicated around the world, would prefer to have the ability to decide the number and timing of their pregnancies, but currently don't have access to the, the contraceptive means that, that women in, in richer countries have. The consequences of that are significant. Um, the biggest one is the, is the close spacing of pregnancies. So if, um, if pregnancies are spaced by 36 months, a third of the remaining child mortality would go away just by spacing births. Because closely spaced births are not good for the mother or the child in terms of nutritional outcomes, particularly iron deficiency, uh, and in terms of birth outcomes, et cetera. So a lot of the remaining maternal mortality and child mortality that we need to address to meet the Millennium Development Goals could actually be addressed simply by giving women the means to do what they want to do, which is to space their births, to have healthier births, and to ultimately decide uh, on the number of, of children they have. So we're part of one of our programs is working in, in conjunction with a, a wide range of other development partners and donors um, to help meet those needs. So we're, in, we're embarked on a program to expand access to contraceptive services to about 120 million of those 225 million women over the next several years. Um, building the systems for delivery, um, building both the supply chains to get good quality, affordable contraceptive products into countries, very poor countries, and more importantly, building the services that can provide women with access to those services in a voluntary and high quality manner, take time to build, um, especially in countries where the primary healthcare system is weak. Because what we've seen work in places that have been able to scale access to contraception rapidly has been that it's often dependent on frontline community health workers. So training and deploying that, those frontline community health workers um, and building the overall primary health care system is an important component of that. If we could give women access to the, the services that they, they desire, we would see the total population of the world stabilize by 2050 closer to 9 billion. If we don't, it'll stabilize at 10 to, in the worst case scenario, goes up to 10 and a half or 11 billion. Related to water. Yes. That's <laughs> yeah. related to water. Um, I think we'll, I would like to ask one final question and then we'll ask our panelists to take a couple of minutes and to share with us your final thoughts about the topic today. Um, I'd like to ask you how um, we should be, you talked a little bit about measuring stunting and some of our problems of measurement and we can't go out of here without having a research question. So what global research and technical assistance do we need to address the most important questions going forward as they pertain to food, water, and children's development? Well, I think one of the more exciting things that's happening is that the World Health Organization, along with UNESCO and UNICEF, has a global indicator effort underway to mm -hmm. look more, again at what are the indicators of child development um, across the prenatal, you know, the birth to eight um, age span. And so they're looking at new indicators of integrated child development, 
uh, new ways of thinking about stunting. Good. And so I think that's promising. It may be a few years till we see it, mm -hmm. but I think there is movement in that direction because we have to think about the measurement issues. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So please that you brought the measurement issue back again because, <clears throat> and for the research, um, measurement is important. And you have challenged the early childhood development people that if you don't have the good measure, you cannot do anything. Uh, actually, we do have measures. For example, as John said, now we, have, we are also developing the measures for 03, but already UNICEF has spearheaded on this, and we have an ECD index, mm -hmm. which is uh, based, in, uh, we, we have this home environment uh, indicators already in the multiple indicators cluster survey, but we also have developed and tested out and piloted in three countries, tested out in Philippines and Jordan and piloted in uh, Kenya. And it is now in a part of the multiple indicators cluster survey measuring the child's development outcome with very simple 10 questions. These are not tests, these are not psychological tests, but this is something to inform us where the children are developmentally by the age of five. These are the questions asked to the mother to rate their children according to their psychosocial, cognitive, and emotional development, and gives us a vi and recently we have been doing some cross analyses, and it, it correlates very well with all other uh, characteristics of the child, including nutrition, home environment, etc., and developmental outcomes. So we do have a measure, and we have almost six countries, um, developing countries now collecting information on this developmental outcome. So we are measuring what we're treasuring. <laughs> and, uh, and, and we have to do more research on that. I, I, coming back to the research question, now because we are collecting data from all these countries and we have the information, we did this with the SRCD group, with the previous multiple mix three data. The universities are welcome to use the data because you, there's an, it's a free access to raw data. You just apply to UNICEF, you get the code, and then use the data the way you like it mm -hmm. and make your correlation and validate the information available on the, on the site already. And what do you think, Chris? Well, you know, we recently supported a, a, a study uh, by the Commission on Investing in Health. Mm -hmm that had a very important bottom line, which said that we, as a globe, face an important historic opportunity. We can, in the next generation, meaning in the next 20 years, we can close the gap in mortality between rich countries and poor countries. That's achievable in our next generation. To do that, we're gonna, I spend a lot of time thinking about that 6.6 .6 million children, how to bring that down. And I, and I think there are two areas we're gonna need research to help us. We're going to need to understand better how to intervene in that very early neonatal mortality. We can't have a million kids dying on their birthday. And we're going to have to solve this problem of, of nutrition and stunting. 45% of the under five child mortalities have nutrition as some component of their causal chain. We have to solve that. That's a multidisciplinary challenge. It's not easy. It's not just finding the right vitamin to drop into the supplementary program. We've made progress doing that, but it's not going to get us the rest of the way. We have to find out and elucidate through research and then define through affordable interventions the connectivity between sanitation, food, water, uh, nutrition, immunity, the microbiome. Um, there's a, you know, a myriad of things that are going to have to be come together to solve that. But the science suggests that in the next 20 years, we have a historic opportunity, and we should take it. That's a great, great answer. Well, we'd like to ask each of you in just two or three sentences oh. <laughs> to uh, sum up or to give us one last point, one last thing that you'd really like us to walk out that door thinking about. Well, you actually gave it to me, Marjorie, and that was this cross-disciplinary work in the university. Oh, that we have more classes that are not by sector, but problem solving across sectors. Nice. So that's what I'd say to the university. To philanthropy, 
Um, actually, I think it, the Gates Foundation is really doing very exciting work. I'd love to see the, the toilet challenge with a group of preschool teachers <laughs> and to see what they would come up with for that challenge. So that's, that's my bringing it together. Okay. Well, I also would like to, first of all, thank you for this uh, opportunity. And we keep talking about integrated approaches. I think the research should be designed, action, operation research should be designed on integrated programs. We have still very limited operational research on integrated programs. And coming back to measure again, we quite often uh, are very much interested in outcome measures like reducing stunting, reducing mortality, etc. But we know that process is also important. We need to also come up with good process indicators, which would be part of the operational research. I guess my bottom line would be to remember um, the good news part of our story. Right? Mm -hmm. we, we often focus, particularly in global health and when we talk about poor countries, on the problems. But you know, as that first curve I showed, we've made incredible progress. Mm -hmm. And we're on the cusp of incredible scientific revolutions that are going to help us close mm -hmm. that gap even further. And so, you know, I think, you know, as we spend time in our policy and advocacy group, we talk to a lot of other funding organizations, which in tough, in tough economic times are tempted to cut these, you know, these kinds of investments. And yet, if you look at them, these are some of the best investments humanity's ever made. So I think it's important to recall that as we think about how we apply our skills, how we apply our money, how we apply our talents, you know, um, the, the, the connectivity between, you know, it used to be when I started in development, it was kind of a thing that people who were interested in those problems worked on, and it was unconnected from the broader inquiries of the academic environment, et cetera. Now they've all really come together, right? So if you're doing genomics research, there's important problems to solve in the U.S. with our obesity epidemic and others, but they're also, some of those same tools will help us inform how we address undernutrition in poor countries. The disciplinary boundaries and the us-them boundaries of, of rich country, poor country are largely dissolving. So it's a, it's a very exciting time to be in this field. I'd like to ask Vice Chancellor Ronnie Green to come forward and he has some final words. Well, first of all, please join me in, in congratulating a wonderful panel and thank our panelists and moderators for being with us today. If I could get Marjorie, maybe you, you and Helen can help me here. Um, we have a tradition in the Hearman Lectures that we like to leave our guests with a memory of coming to the University of Nebraska, which is the Hearman Medal that signifies them being a Hearman lecturer. So Marjorie and Helen, would you please present those to Chris and Nerper and Joan for joining us here at the university. It's actually really pretty. It looks like it. Oh my God, that's beautiful. Thank you. Well, thank you. I want to take a special moment here as we're closing up today to acknowledge and thank a couple of groups. One is all of our lectures are live streamed and are available and archived on the web at the Human Lectures website. And our, our video production people here do a wonderful job in all of these lectures and all of what they do. So please join me in thanking our, our technical support folks. And I would also like to particularly thank Judy Nelson, who's standing in the back, back here in the red, who is really the coordinator of our Hearman Lecture Series. She does all of the behind the scenes work. Judy, thank you for three years of wonderful work that you've contributed to the lectures. And lastly, I can't go without thanking Helen Riggs today, because Helen was the instigator, if you will, of today's lecture. She sits on the Faculty Advisory Committee for the Hearman Lecture Series um, and suggested such a topic a couple of years ago first. And I told her, go for it and develop that panel and you can see what a wonderful job, Helen, you've done. We really appreciate Thank that. You. Very, very much. Thank you all for being here. <laughs> we will begin our 2014-15 series on September the 25th. 
That will be our opening Hearman Lecture for the year, and it will focus on the issue of climate change. Uh, it will be our release and rollout of a report that we're currently doing for the state of Nebraska on the implications of climate change for Nebraska, and particularly for resource management around agriculture in Nebraska. So mark September 25th uh, is the starting Hearman Lecture for our next year, and we hope to see you all there. Thank you very much for being here today, and thank our panel. Thanks. Thank you.